Good morning, everyone. Excuse me. Uh, first things first, uh, we're so thankful today to have Miss Evelyn back with us. Um, good to see you here this morning. Uh, got a couple announcements. Bonnie still needs some help, guys. Uh, she needs help with the youth. Someone to teach the youth during church services, July and August. Especially in August, she will not be here. November. November. Those are close. <laughs> That's my dyslexia. No matter how I can that. Uh, it's been a rough morning. Uh, so July and November. Miss Bonnie won't be here most of November. She's got things going on. So really needs help July and November. And then please don't forget the brown paper bags and the brown paper they're going to use to make the waterfall. Uh, we've gathered some so far. Um, but try to get those in, please. Uh, let's see. Is anybody missing a key on a green key, green key chain that says PPOC front door? All right, fine. Um, I'm going to keep it in the back and we'll keep asking. Uh, John found it outside on the sidewalk. It does not belong to our building, so somebody's going to be missing a key eventually. Um, let's see. We've got Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, still, let's see. Wednesday night meals are over for the summer. Uh, June 8th. Bruce, are you going to talk on that? Sure. Go ahead. Okay, this Saturday night, I talk to Pizza Cafe. They'll invite us there. They not probably have pizza. They have subs, um, lasagna, salads, all types of stuff. 5 30, if you want to make it there. Pizza Cafe. Pizza Cafe. It's in Stone Mountain off 78. Pizza Cafe, Stone Mountain 78. Yeah. On the left hand side. Right okay. before you get to the mountain. I know what that's it. Good stuff. Um, anything else Father's Day? I want to talk about Father's Day. Uh, we got a lot going on right now. I'm in and out of town like crazy. Started a new job. I want to put Father's Day off until the Sunday after Father's Day. I don't want to do it Sunday of Father's Day because everybody's got things going on. So I figured the Sunday after we usually do a barbecue for the Vacation Bible School. The Sunday after we'll just couple it in together with Father's Day. We'll have hamburgers, hot dogs, cold pork, potato salad, baked beans. You know, all the trimming, if that's all right with everybody, I just want to make sure it's all right. Lori says, good to go. Gotcha. That's all I got. Thank that's, you. Bruce, this is how you put it. Does everybody want to eat? Yeah, okay, good. I might even make mac and cheese that day. We'll see. I'm going to serve some food, we'll do that. I know nobody likes that, so I'll, I'll just make that. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Excuse me. All right, well, now we'll come to our time of communion. Uh, we're going to pass the trays and partake of the communion. And before we do that, we're going to have a communion song and a communion song.
We think we understand a thing once we can understand why. But may I submit that in the case of the Lord's Supper, the answer is to who also has great significance. So let us ask, for whom did Christ die? For our weaker brother, 1 Corinthians 8, 9-12, is tempted to be impatient with those who are immature in faith. It's often convenient to segregate those who have a besetting sin, drugs on the right, alcohol in the center, pornography on the left. Stay in line, please. We see them as weaker, and mind you, this might be true, but do we see them as the one for whom Christ died? One for whom our Lord cares. For the just and the unjust, 1 Peter 3. No one has the credentials to earn salvation. It is a gift. We need to remember that the gift was given for all, not just for the nice. The frauds, welfare cheats, con artists, those two are those for whom Christ died. For the helpless, ungodly, Romans 5, those who are admired down in sin, who see no way out, he is the help of all who seek him, the joy of all who find him. There are no worthy sinners and unworthy sinners, just sinners and his salvation. For you, 1 Peter, love lifted even me. Why then do we so often look for and find the evil in others? One reason is this, it's easy enough to find. We're all sinners. It's just that some of us manage to hide it in a socially acceptable way. More than that, we are often quick to assume the beggar by the road is a fake. The politician is lying to us. Those who think us weirdo, right-wing fundamentalists have no idea what they're talking about. Sin is easy to spot in others and hard to spot in ourselves. It's easy to outline the cure for others and hard to take your own medicine. Do you see it? We come together for the Lord's Supper and our minds race over the subject of sin for ourselves. We linger over others. This matter is serious. Then why do we do this? The honest answer is that we are disobedient. We call Him Savior. Do we really call him Lord? When you drink the cup and eat the bread, you proclaim his death until he comes again. How can we proclaim that and still look down our noses at others? There is a cure for this. It is the love of Christ. He demands no robot-like obedience. Rather, obedience in Christ is based on love. For he told us that if we love him, he will do as he commands. If your nose is shiny from looking down, Look up instead. Love him deeply and sincerely, honestly and courageously. When you do, you will see those for whom Christ died in a different way, not just sinners, but children of God. It's, it becomes easier and easier to do, uh, especially you know, the last 15, 20 years where times are changing. And it is easy to see the sin. We remember the bad stuff and not the good stuff. But we all have to remember, none of us are worthy without this sacrifice, without this death. Then we are all sinners. And some of us are good at hiding it, maybe better than others. But we're all sinners. When we see those people we know have issues, have problems, maybe ungodly, we don't turn our backs on them, we don't turn our noses up to them. We represent Christ through our actions, through our words, and the way we live our lives. And by taking communion today, we're taking communion not just because we are Christians, not just because we appreciate what he did for us, but understanding he did it for all of us, not just the people who hide the sin, but for all sinners. Gentlemen. <coughs> Father, we come before you this morning proclaiming that we are sinners. We are disobedient. We do not deserve your grace and your mercy. But through your Son, Jesus Christ, and the ultimate sacrifice he paid, he paid on that cross, we have been clean. We have been given a new life in you. 
be with each of us in our hearts, not to judge others, to judge ourselves, to change our ways, and be the light of your community. For it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. sing our songs of praise this morning in this place. Lord, we just pray that your name may be glorified in our midst and 
in everything that we do and everything that we say, Lord, may you be glorified. This morning, Lord, as we come to uh, corporately just pray, Lord, we're reminded of those that are in great need in their life. There's several, Lord, that we know who are struggling with uh, sickness and disease, pain and suffering. And we, Lord, we just pray that you would bring the healing that they need for their bodies and that you would ease the discomfort, ease the pain and the suffering right now because we know, Lord, that you are a God who heals. We trust you with that, Lord, today. Lord, there are those that we know that are struggling because they have lost loved ones. We pray, Lord, that you would just come alongside of them, comfort them in the times of their sorrow and their grief, Lord. Be with them. Lord, we know of those that are making decisions in life, financial decisions, relationship decisions. And we pray that you might be with them as they contemplate these choices and decisions, that they would look to you, Lord, your word and your truth, your guidance and direction. We pray, Lord, for our nation, for our country, pray for our president, for our leaders, that they would make wise and godly decisions. Lord, we pray for our service men and service women serving around the world. You keep them safe and bring them home soon. Lord, we pray that as a local church right here in this community, that we will be a bright light for you. And that people will see you living in us. And that your name would be glorified in this community. Right now, Lord, we come to a time of worship. But we want to worship you through your word. <coughs> Pray, Lord, that as we open up our Bibles and study your word, Lord, that you might reveal your truth that you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you open up your Bibles with me and turn to James, uh, James <coughs> chapter 2. And I'd like to read verses uh, 14 through 26 today. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Went to Michigan this past week to visit with Lori's mom. Up there, it's not spring yet. <clears throat> the flowers are not blooming. The grass is not pollinating. The trees are not even pollinating. It was like going back into winter all of a sudden. As soon as we crossed over into Michigan, and my allergies got a relief the whole time. I never had to take a pill, an allergy pill, and I could breathe clearly. And then as soon as we left Michigan, <clears throat> immediately started sneezing, so coughing. Sorry about that this morning. So as you turn in your Bibles to this passage that I would like to read to you this morning, and as we just continue to make our way through this letter that James wrote, to uh, remember the background is this is James and he's writing to um, the Christians who have been scattered abroad. These are church members that he knows from Jerusalem. Many of them he has discipled and led to Christ. The persecution has come among the church and they're scattered abroad. Remember, he's one of the first to be martyred for Christ. And so this is the earliest um, letter in the New Testament that we have that was written to the churches. It's this early word, early instructions that he had. And as we're making our way through this letter, he writes it not necessarily as a, a theologian explaining key doctrines of the faith, but yet he brings them up in the letter and he gives them practical ways to live this truth out. And when we, got, when we get to chapter 2 of this letter, he has talked to them, first of all, in this first part of this letter, he has talked to them about their relationship with Christ and relationship with the teachings and the doctrines and, and the, the Word of God. But when he gets to this uh, last paragraph of chapter 2, he talks about the, something basic to all Christianity. Faith and works. And churches, denominations, theologians down through the ages 
have ha tried to explain faith and works and how they work together. Believing and trusting in Christ alone and in doing the works that God has for us to do. The works of righteousness. No doubt these Christians who have been scattered abroad, this is one of the subject matters. This is the one of the things evidently that has come up that James has heard. And he wants to be able to clear it up and to give them better understanding of how our faith in Christ and our works that we do for Christ work together. Together. It's almost hard to believe or hard to imagine or, or visualize and comprehend in our mind that our Christian life we know is faith, is trusting in Christ, and that is trusting in Christ alone. But we also know that there is instructions that God has given us in how to obey and live the Christian life. So how do they work together? How do they work together? We know from the Bible that faith is foundational. Faith is foundational to our salvation. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. We're saved by grace through faith. We are commanded in the Bible in 2 Corinthians to walk by faith and not by sight. We are instructed in the Bible that without faith it's impossible to please God. Hebrews 11, 6. We are told in Romans chapter 14, verse 23, that whatever we do apart from faith is sin. So faith, how does faith and works work out in our Christian life. James, once again, as he writes these words, he breaks it down in, in, in a simple way for, for people to understand. The church that he's writing to, and for us now, 2,000 years later, reading this letter, to better understand faith and work. So let me read the text to you. If you, if you don't mind, will you stand with me as I read the Bible to you? And before you sit down, I want to encourage you to share something with one little statement with your neighbor a take home from today's message. So James chapter 2, starting in verse 14. He says, What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warm and we and be fed. And yet you do, you do not give them what is necessary for their body. What use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But some may, someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up, his, offered up Isaac his son on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works. And as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled. Which says, and Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the message, messengers and then sent them out by another way? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Before you sit down, share this one statement with your neighbor. And it's simply this. Remember, heart, soul, and mind. Thank you. You can be seated. Remember, heart, soul and mind you notice from just the reading of this scripture this paragraph of scripture that in these verses James discusses the relationship between faith and works he explains one way of seeing this paragraph is that he explains three different kinds of faith but only one of which is true saving faith 
So what are the three kinds of faith? Well, first of all, he talks about dead faith. Several times in that passage, he used the phrase dead faith. And he classified what dead faith was. On your outline, I put there three, three things about this dead faith that he brings up. The first one is that it consists of empty words. Verse 14. He says, what use is it, my brother, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that save him? If he has faith, but there's no works to it. He has a profession of faith that he believes in Christ or that he believes in God. He has a profession, but there's no works that follow. He just believes. He just makes that statement. He just intellectually, through his mind and through his thinking, believes those things. Faith that is genuine and saving will inevitably, inevitably produce good works. Regeneration and transformation happens in a new, with a new longing to forsake sin and forsake self and gladly serve the Lord Jesus Christ, obeying His divine standards that He presents to them. The Apostle Paul, when he presented the gospel in Ephesus, the pagans in Ephesus who, were, who had their magic art books and their witchcraft, they took all their books out into the middle of the city square and they piled them up and they burned them. Because obviously, if they were going to believe and trust in Jesus Christ and surrender their life and their all, it meant that certain things in their life had to go and they immediately dealt with them. They knew that God would have nothing to do with witchcraft and magic. When Paul went to Thessalonica, it says that the Thessalonians, when he presented the gospel to them, they turned to God from idols. What that meant was they turned to God from idols. It meant that they realized and knew that when they trusted God and when they surrendered to Christ and his will in their life, it meant no more idols in their life. The idols had to go in their life. And he knew that their words could not just simply be words, but there had to be an action. Something would happen. So James says dead faith is all about empty words. Secondly, it's all about false compassion. He says in verse 15 and 16 and 17, he talks about ministering to someone, having compassion to someone. And he says, if you say that you're going to have compassion and concern for somebody, but yet you never do anything about it. He says, is that faith real faith? And he says, that's dead faith. It's a kind of faith that has a false compassion. You say you're going to do it, but yet you don't. You know it's the right thing to do, and you have the knowledge and the truth that you should do it, but yet you never do anything about it. You just talk about doing good things. You talk about having compassion on someone else. So dead faith is not just empty words. It's a false compassion. The story of the Good Samaritan. Jesus' point was when it comes to our neighbor, we are obligated to help anyone in need. <coughs> Friend or stranger, fellow citizen or foreigner, someone we admire or someone who is despised. Anyone can be our neighbor that we help. <coughs> Thirdly, James qualifies dead faith and he says it is someone who has a shallow conviction. It is a recognition of certain facts about God and His Word without submission to either. Not submitting to His Word and not submitting to what God's Word says. Living faith, in complete contrast to dead faith, produces good fruit. And that good fruit is the natural expression of their life. It's not only the natural expression, it's the whole purpose of their life. From then on out, it is to bear good, godly fruit. The dead faith, the, way, the best way that I've come up to classify what dead faith is, is just simply an intellectual belief in God. And so James' admonition to those he's writing to, even to us today, is beware of simple intellectual faith. The second kind of faith that he brings up in this text is demonic faith. 
demon faith. Look at verse 19 and 20. He says, the demons also believe and they shudder. And he says it in such a way that you, you can't possibly believe that demons are going to be saved or that demons could even practice saving faith. Well, what about these demons that he talks about? In the Bible, what we know that demons know and they acknowledge the truth about God. What do demons know? Demons are monotheistic. They believe in one God, in the one true God, Jehovah God. They believe in that God. Not only that, they know that the scriptures are the word of God. Not only do they know that the scriptures are the word of God, but they know that Jesus is the son of God and that Jesus is fully God and fully human. They know that Jesus' salvation is by grace through faith. They know that Jesus died on the cross, was buried in the tomb and rose from the dead. They know that Jesus is now seated on high and someday he's going to come back again. They believe and know of the second coming of Christ. But yet they are not saved. They believe in a literal heaven and a literal hell. All of the foundational truths of Christianity that are divine and eternal, they believe those truths. But yet they hate the truth and they hate the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But yet they've got all of the facts. They've got all the truth. The second thing James says about the demons is not only are, do they believe, but he says they shudder. To shudder, the word shudder means that they shudder in God's truth in a statement of fear, in a state of fear. Matthew chapter 8, verse 29 and 31, when Jesus, when Jesus cast out the demons in the, in the man that was possessed by demons, the demons say, you know, don't, don't cast us out of this region. You know, put us in these, in, in these pigs over here. For some reason or another, Jesus, he, he, he responds to the request and he allows it to happen. And the pigs run off the hill and they run over the hill and they're, and they're dead. But he said, don't let, don't let it. They know, they know who Jesus Christ is. And not only that, they fear him. They have an emotional response to who Jesus is. So not only do they believe the truth, all the foundational truths of Christianity, but they have an emotional response to Christ. So the challenge is demonic faith. What is it? He says their faith, he says, is useless. The word useless means fruitless and bears no productivity. It bears no fruit in their life. There's no godliness that comes from them. Even though they believe the facts and they emotionally have a response to God. And the warning is to beware of a mere feeling-centered faith. Many people will say, I know because I feel like I'm saved. I feel it. So feelings. I know it because I not only feel it, but I know that God... That I know who God is kind of faith. But the third kind of faith that James goes in and instead of describing it in theological terms, he simply brings about two illustrations to illustrate what real saving faith is. I call it on your outline point number three, decisive faith. That's to me what it is. It's a decision. A decision to trust Christ. A decision to walk by faith. A decision to do what God wants you to do. A decision to follow His commands. A decision to obey Him. And this, this kind of decisive saving faith that, that we are to have in Christ is, is qualified by three simple things. The first one is decisive faith is based upon the Word of God. It's always based upon the Word of God. James has already said in James 1.18 that our spiritual rebirth is based upon the Word of God. And in, verse, in chapter 1, verse 21, is about, it is about receiving the Word. And when we receive the Word of God, it saves us. The two illustrations he's going to use is Abraham and Rahab. Both of them 
heard the word of God and they received the message of God through his word. Faith is only as good as who you are going to trust in. It's not simply faith in faith, but it's trusting in Christ. They trusted in the Messiah, the Messiah who was going to come. They trusted in the Savior. Decisive faith is based on the word of God. Secondly, decisive faith involves the whole man, the whole man. Dead faith teaches us only intellect. Demonic faith involves both the mind and the emotion, but decisive faith involves the will. The will. The whole person plays a part in true saving faith. The mind understands the truth. The heart desires the truth. And the will acts upon the truth. So decisive faith is based on the word of God, involves the whole man. And thirdly, decisive faith leads to action. Saving faith leads to obedience on the part of the will. And this obedience is not an isolated event. It continues throughout the whole life of the Christian. It leads to works. It always leads to good works. I relate this to my own life in this way. We could stop for a moment and think about diet plans. At some point of time in our life, eventually, we're going to have to get to a place where we say, you know, I need to do something about this weight. And so what we can do is we can talk about a diet plan or we can read about a diet plan and we can know all the details about every diet plan that there is. And not only that, we can get all excited and worked up about the fact that we're going to go on a diet plan. And we can plan a date and we can get emotionally excited about I'm going to do this and then I'm going to lose all this weight. And I'm going to feel this way. I'm going to feel great once I get to this place and this point and this weight loss. And we can talk about it. We can feel good about it. But you know that it always takes the third step. And the third step, you have to will yourself to do it. You have to actually follow the plan. You have to do the exercise. You have to discipline yourself. It means that your will is going to be involved. Your will to surrender to what it is that God is you're going to accomplish. And when we come to faith and trust in Christ, it's based on the word of God. It's true. He reveals his word to us. It is based upon not only the faith, but also it is going to involve every aspect of our life. But it's also the action. And God promises that when we take that step of faith, that he will come along with his Holy Spirit and give us that energy, that determination, that power from within our will to accomplish and be obedient to what he has for us to do. Now the way that James wanted to clarify this, or for them that he's preaching to or writing to, and for us this morning is he used those two illustrations. He talked about two people, complete contrast to each other. He talks about Abraham. The man that God called to be the, 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 to be the leader of a nation of people. A nation was going to come from him. And in this nation, God was going to do certain things. But he called a Jew to follow him. He called, a, the Bible says Abraham was a friend of God. He called a friend. He called a godly man. He not only did that, but he called someone who was close and dear. He, he called someone that was logical. So he brings up Abraham, who immediately they can relate to. But then he brings up Rahab. Complete opposite. A Gentile. A woman who's, cut, who's, who's called in our Bibles the harlot. An immoral woman. He brings her up. And someone who is a part of the enemies of God. So he brings out two completely different people and he shows the, the contrast or the thing he wants them to understand is both of them responded in the same way to faith and trust in God. That was the common thing. They both experienced saving faith. 
Abraham was the one that God called out of Ur of Chaldeans to lead him into Canaan, to make out of him a great nation. It was through Israel that God would bring the Savior into the world. In Genesis chapter 15, we have the calling of Abraham. And God took him outside and he showed him all the stars in the sky. And he says, your seed is going to be so numerous. It's going to be more than all these stars. And he made a covenant and a promise to him. And Abraham responded with faith. He says, he, the Bible says he believed God and it was credited to him. It was reckoned to him as righteousness. He believed in what God was saying. Even though he couldn't see any of it, even though he didn't even have any children, he still believed. And for years, he went without children, believing and trusting in that truth. He says, this is the model. This is the example of real trust and dispendency. He says in that phrase, it was reckoned to him as righteousness. The word reckoned or James uses the word justified. He stood justified. Romans chapter 4. Paul goes into great detail to describe justification by faith alone. That our salvation is based upon what Jesus Christ did. What he's done on the cross. His death on the cross. And because of that, we can stand before God justified. The word justification. Because he brings it up in our text. Can mean two things. It's a legal term. First of all, it's an acquittal that, that all the crimes against you have been wiped out. So it was a, an acquittal term. You've been justified. It was also a describing word. And it, when it was used in the New Testament to describe, it meant that you have been vindicated. You are someone who is justified. In God's sight, it happens. And then throughout your life, in God's sight, from then on out, you stand as someone who is justified. That's how the New Testament uses that word, in God's standing. And so Abraham models for us what true justification is. Believing and trusting. And then James goes on to say that it was because of not just his faith, but what he did. Well, what did he do? Genesis chapter 22 James references this account in Abraham's life. Years later, after God had given him a son, he said, take your son, your one and only son Isaac, take him up to Mount Moriah and sacrifice him to me. And Abraham, James is saying, Abraham was obedient to do what God was calling him to do. And he was obedient because he had already believed and trusted in Christ for salvation and he was living that life of faith and he was willing to even do this extreme thing that God was calling him to do and his faith was activated when he put his son up on that altar and he was willing to take the knife and kill him believing and knowing that God could do miraculously what he wanted to do he could still make him the father of a great nation he could resurrect Isaac from the dead he believed in the resurrection. He believed in all those things because he had trusted in Christ and he was walking by faith. He wasn't a perfect man, right? It was not about perfection. It was about walking by faith. Remember he and Sarah tried to work things out for God and there's Hagar and Ishmael and the conflict that was created then and still goes on even today. So he wasn't perfect. But he was a man of faith who trusted God and walked by faith in God. Abraham. Then he brings up Rahab. In Joshua chapter 2 and chapter 6. We read about Rahab. She was the one that when, the, when Joshua, who was leading God's people, got to the promised land, Jericho was the first city in the way. And he sends the spies into Jericho. And Rahab was the, was the one who volunteered to hide the spies in her house. It says in Joshua chapter 2, some amazing things about Rahab. She heard them say what was going to happen to their city. She heard it and she realized and she understood the condemnation that was coming upon the wicked city that she lived in. And it said that her heart melted. She responded to what God's word was to her. And she, it says her heart melted and she believed in that one true God of heaven and her. She surrendered her life. She trusted in him. Her heart was melted. Sounds like the demonic faith, right? 
then she did another step. She missed her life hiding the spies. When they came by and said, are they here? She lied about it. No, they're not. She risked her life. She risked her life to hide the, the spies, but then secondly, she risked her life when she shared with her family the word of God and the deliverance that could come. If they would get in her house, she put the, the scarlet red thread in the window. If you get in my house, you will not be condemned. You will not die. She preached to them the good news. She was the first soul winner. And that's what she did. She risked that when she shared that truth with her family and friends. They could have all turned her in. But she risked it. She knew that her faith was not just a faith that she just something that she believed. It wasn't just a feeling that she had. But she had to act upon it. She had to act on that faith. And that was the point that James has. That was, the gem, that was what he wanted to, to share with those then and with us now. She proved her faith by her works. Think about the small amount of knowledge and understanding that Rahab had of this God that she was now trusting in and surrendering to. But she willingly did that and then sacrificed her life. When it came to a good Jew in this day and time, the one thing they would always quote was Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. They had a hard time getting past that. Their faith was in the one God, and their faith was in the fact that they were part of the chosen people. They were part of Abraham's lineage. They were God's holy people. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. That was their constant statement of faith that they made. It was very hard for them to get to the second part of that great command. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength is what it says in Deuteronomy. That I read to you this morning at the beginning of the service. That's the key verse of the whole Bible. The key verse is there's one God. More than just one God. And our response to the one God is to love Him with all of our heart, our soul and our strength. Now in Matthew 22, when the man came up to Jesus and said, what is the greatest commandment? What is the greatest thing? That's when Jesus quoted that passage. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul. And Jesus said, mind. Your heart, your soul, and your mind. Your heart. Your emotions, your feelings, your passion. Your soul. Your soul is your will. That's who you really are, down deep inside. Your will. The person you are. But Jesus says mind. He went from strength to mind. Why did he change the word? Was Jesus misquoting the scriptures? No, he was not. He was interpreting what the word strength meant. It meant your mind because the battle is in our minds. It is what we think on. It is what we are going to think on. And it is a constant thing. So my conclusion or my understanding of the kind of faith that James was talking about, it involves my heart, my soul, and my mind. Sold out and surrendered to Jesus. Is that what faith is to you? Is it your heart, your soul, your mind? Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you this morning for your word and for your truth and how James wrote this inspired, authoritative word from you to us today, Lord. May we, Lord, in our lives demonstrate this kind of decisive, saving, dynamic faith. I pray that if there's anyone here today who's never come to that realization of who you are and honestly surrendered their will to you, 
Not just their mind and their thinking, not just their emotion, but their will. And said, I'm going to will to serve you, Lord. I'm going to give you my life and my all. Lord, I pray today that those that hear that, Lord, may, may trust you. For our, tri- our salvation is trusting in you alone. But at the moment that we trust you, Lord, from that moment on in our life, you want to produce Good works. The fruit of a righteous, holy, godly life. May that be the kind of faith that we believe in. May that be the kind of faith that we work out in our life each and every day. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me? We're going to sing a decision song. And if you want to make a decision to trust in Christ... I encourage you to do that today.